Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Hear now the good news of our Lord and Savior. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. So now which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. <clears throat> the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. As I was doing my preparations for today's sermon, I was reminded of this quote, quote by Professor Amy Jill Levine in which she argues that, that the point of Christianity and religion is, is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. To comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. She continues on to say that the parables are, are Jesus doing some afflicting upon the comfortable. She says, if if we hear a parable and we go, I really like that. Or worse, fail to take any challenges. We are not listening well enough. If we hear a parable and think, I really like that. We are not listening well enough. How many of you have, after reading that felt afflicted? Some of you may feel afflicted today, but how many of you felt afflicted after hearing about the Good Samaritan? I would venture to guess not many of us feel afflicted by that passage. Why? Why doesn't this passage feel like a punch to the gut? Why doesn't this parable make us move uncomfortably in our pews this morning? Why is this some people's favorite story in the entire Bible? The answer to that's not hard. It's because we just know it. We know it too well. You see, when we know a, a story too well, it loses its power to afflict us, to change us. It loses its power to stun us and wake us up. Not that the story is any less powerful. The story has lost no power, but, but we know it too well. You see, we know the story of the Good Samaritan. Every, I bet many of you could have retold that story quicker and better than I told it. We know what the story means. You don't need to answer that. I bet what I was risking while I was reading it, many of you just drifted off because you said, I, I know this one. 
I'm good. I don't need to hear the rest. Man in a ditch, good Samaritans, comes, takes them, heals them. We're good. There's the story. I do it too. Don't worry. I, I, I do it too when I hear passages I know. I zone out. But if we follow the example of Professor Levine, then this story about a man beaten almost half to death, left on the side of the road, who was, who was passed by, by not one, but two religious professionals. And then is only helped when a terrible Samaritan comes by. If we're taking Professor Levine's advice, we should be afflicted by that story. It should challenge us. But I think too often we take this story and we boil it down. Well, let's be nice. Let's be nice to those who are in need. Let's help people. Let's be like the Good Samaritan. And don't hear what I'm not saying here this morning. But is that all? Is that all this story means for us? Reminding us to be good people? Again, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be good people and help people on the side of the road. But did Jesus take all this time in this beautiful story to just say, be nice? Because I think when we boil it down to just be nice, it leaves us unchanged and unaffected. And it makes sense that we can like the story. And I would argue today that we shouldn't like this story. And we only like it because we know it. And so this morning, briefly, I want to try and recapture the affliction that this passage was supposed to afflict on us. I want us to get past the be nice meaning of this parable and get a little uncomfortable. And I know that's scary. I know I'm not doing something fun this morning. It's scary to be uncomfortable, but I think that's what we need. Maybe we need to get a little afflicted because the be nice meaning of this passage, if we look out at our world, isn't doing a whole lot. So this, start, this story starts with a legal expert in the Mosaic law. He knows all the scriptures of the Old Testament. He knows what they're supposed to be doing, what is right and wrong. And he asks Jesus, how do I achieve this eternal life you've been talking about? Jesus, you've been talking about eternal life. I want some of it. How do I get it? And I think that's the first point we need to remember. You see, this parable is about how do we gain eternal life. We often think about eternal life, we think about life after death. Eternal life means, what happens when I die? Will I go on? But really, eternal life is just as much a concern about life now as it is about life in the future. It's just so much about living a full life now as it is, is a full life after we leave. And I think many of us here today feel as though we aren't living a full life. That something is lacking. That something just isn't right. It's not clicking. We're searching for more. And I would say maybe we need to look at this parable. Maybe we need to look at how often we see the person in the ditch. Actually just see them. Maybe we need to think about how often we are passing by on the other side of the road. When we aren't sure that we're living a full life, maybe we need to think about what it means to be a good Samaritan. Because I would argue when we fail to be the good Samaritan, we fail to live into the promise of eternal life. And we fail to actually live When we fail to be the Good Samaritan, we fail to live into eternal life. And, and I don't know about you, but that's afflicting to me. To remember that my choice to cross to the other side of the road, which I make way too often, is my rejection of Jesus' gift 
of eternal life. Every time I pass is me saying no to that gift of grace. I don't know about you, but when I read this story thinking about rejecting the gift of eternal life, I get a lot more uncomfortable with every time I pass by the other side. But I don't think the discomfort ends there. You see, the lawyer gets asked another question. He doesn't just ask, how do I gain eternal life? If you remember, Jesus says, well, now you answer it, because Jesus doesn't answer questions. He says, give me the answer. And so the lawyer does that. He answers correctly to gain eternal life. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And of course, love your neighbor as yourself. He gets the right answer. But here's where I want us to live for a second today. Jesus says, do this and you will live. There's that life thing again. That's, that's the key to life. But then the lawyer does what I think we do all the time. We did it this morning in our Sunday school class. We couldn't get around this, this question. We want to muddy the waters. We want to th make things more difficult. We want to take simple statements. And we want to add clauses and caveats to them. The lawyer asked Jesus, but who is my neighbor? Love your neighbor as yourself. But, but Jesus, who's my neighbor? You see a simple statement, love your neighbor. Simple, right? We go, but yeah, but add some more to that. Flesh that out for me, Jesus. Define that. You see, because he doesn't want to know who his neighbor is. He wants to know who he doesn't have to love. Jesus, who don't I have to love? He really wants to know who is not my neighbor. You see, this week I read a lot of articles and sermons on these, on these passages, and, and most of them centered around answering the question, who is my neighbor? That's what they want to Who's my neighbor? It's not a bad question to ask. But I don't need a whole sermon to answer that question. The answer to who is my, who is my neighbor is simply everyone. Name me a person and Jesus will say, that's your neighbor. I know some of you would have preferred that sermon. But who is my name? Everyone. When Jesus is telling this parable, he doesn't just say, be nice. Or else he wouldn't have put in that the person being nice is a Samaritan. And for us, there's no stock value there. What Jesus is saying is that the worst person you know is your neighbor. And that's simply... Who is your neighbor? The worst person you can imagine. That's it. Love that person. But I think we know that. We understand that. We've heard that, that sermon many times. We've, we've done that Bible study. We know we should be treating everyone. We understand that we shouldn't have criteria for who we should help. We know that. Not that we live that, but we know it. But what I am more interested in is why we ask the question to begin with. Why do we ask Jesus to qualify his statements? Why do we even ask the question, who is my neighbor? And it's not just that question. We do it all the time. Jesus says, give away all your money, and we go explain that. But you mean after, after my bank account's comfortable, right, Jesus? Jesus? Then I should give away all my money? Explain that a little better to me, that give away all your money statement. Jesus says, love your enemy. And we go, explain to me what enemies you really mean. What if they did this to me? Then I'm good, right? I don't have to love that person. Jesus says, go and feed my sheep. And we go, who are your sheep? Who are they? Remember, in all these questions, we're really asking who aren't your sheep so we don't have to love those people. Go spread the gospel, but where? You don't mean I have to go there, right, Jesus? 
He says, go and do likewise. And we ask him, what are we supposed to do? He says, follow me. And we go and ask, but I'm not following you there, right? He says, love your neighbors. And we go and ask him to put up walls and fences. And I think that's the answer to why we ask these questions, because it's uncomfortable to not have boundaries. It's uncomfortable that Jesus said, do these things. It's uncomfortable not to have any boundaries. It's uncomfortable to think that when Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me, he might have actually meant it. Or when he said, love your enemies, he might have actually meant that. He wasn't just filling space on a page. Or maybe the hardest one, when he said, I came to save all, he might have actually meant that. You see, this parable to me reminds us that every time we try to limit Jesus, he will time and time again expand that grace and mercy farther than we're comfortable with. It's not just be nice, but give mercy to everyone, no buts about it. And so just to ponder on, why do we ask Jesus to put boundaries on grace? The story is uncomfortable because it doesn't allow us to build walls. Because I don't think we ask follow-up questions so that we can be better. We don't ask him, like, explain this better to me, Jesus, I want to do better. But rather, so that we can do less. Every time we ask Jesus to clarify, we are asking him to put up a boundary on his love. And that's afflicting to me. The last uncomfortable thing about this parable I want to highlight is in the action of the priest and the Levite. And I know we don't like to do this. We don't like to think of ourselves as the priest and the Levite because they're the pompous religious folk. But when we don't see them as more than pompous religious folk, we don't put ourselves in their shoes. You see, because the priest and the Levite, by all accounts of the law, probably were doing what was right. They are trying to stay religiously clean. To come in contact with a half-dead person and a Samaritan, well, not a Samaritan, to come in contact with a half-dead person in blood would have kept them out of the temple, kept them from worshiping God. You see, their decision was technically and lawfully the right decision. But Jesus says, go and do like the Samaritan. You see, we often let our religion get in the way of helping. We lock the doors of our churches. And in turn, we lock out those who may need a little sanctuary. It's a smart choice. I'm not saying it's not a smart choice. I'm not saying it's not even the lawful choice. But I am saying that we may be keeping out people who are searching for sanctuary. We say we are following the example of Christ by believing something, but in turn, we are hurting people. So how often do we let, let right belief trump loving and helping people? You see, if at any point we choose being right or lawful over compassion, Jesus says we're wrong. If at any point we are willing to put our belief before bringing mercy, we are passing by on the other side. If at any point we value being right over human life, we're passing by on the other side. The priest and the Levite and even the lawyer asking the question, they know the law. They know it. They know they are to love their neighbors as themselves. But to know the law is never good enough. To know the rules is never enough if we aren't willing to show love and compassion. 
It's afflicting to me to think that I can be religiously and lawfully correct, and Jesus will still say you made the wrong choice. You see, this scripture is really easy when we say just be nice to people. But when this parable is our source of eternal life, it gets a little bit more afflicting. It gets a little bit more afflicting when we ponder why we want to put boundaries on God's love and God's grace. And it's a whole lot more conflicting and afflicting and confusing when we imagine that we could be doing everything lawfully and Jesus would still say you made the wrong choice. This parable should afflict us. But in it, we should always remember that Jesus is the ultimate Good Samaritan. He came to us when we are in the ditch and offered us a love we do not deserve. He extended a life to us, an eternal life, that we have no business having. He extended the boundaries of grace to accept us. And yes, Jesus broke laws and rituals all so that we could be saved from the ditches. They killed him for breaking laws and rituals so that we could have eternal life. See, Jesus is searching the ditches for us. And maybe all we need to do is just get a little bit more uncomfortable in this world. Amen.